Alright, and welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. In this video we are talking about the Dragon of Calvinism and we are dealing with part three of the Dragon of Calvinism. And you say, what is the Dragon of Calvinism? And the idea of the Dragon of Calvinism is that you start to deal with the problem, you start to address Calvinism, and you think it's a simple issue. You think it's a very simple issue, like, if I could just get these people to see the facts, because the facts matter, right? The facts matter. Well, when you delve into the issue, you find out that when you start talking to people who are inflicted by this disease of Calvinism, that the facts don't matter. They don't matter. And and so it's it's like this issue of what does matter. How how did these people get to the point where the facts don't matter? So the the concept of a dragon you know, we've done two other parts to this series so far, and I encourage you to go back and watch those when you get a chance. But the the mythopoetic picture of a dragon, what that is, is when you start investigating a problem, and then you find out that it's way worse than you thought it was. It's not just a blown light bulb. It's, uh, you know, Iran launched an EMP and none of the electronics work. You know, you once you start investigating, the problem is just way worse than you thought it was. And it's so daunting, people just want to walk away from it. I mean, it's it's bad. It's kind of like when you when you lean over and you open the cabinet for the next roll of toilet paper, and it's not there. It's just a bad problem you don't want to be in. And so that's kind of what this is. It's the dragon. It's imagine imagine the issue is as bad as it could be, and that's that's what the dragon is. Okay. The illustrations we've used before is like peeling back the layers of an onion. And I'll show you this little little diagrams that we have here, little pictures, little visual aids, like peeling back the layers of an onion. And you keep peeling you keep peeling back and peeling back the layers of the onion. You find you keep finding more real problems that aren't the real issue. So on the surface, you have a Calvinist telling you, Well, we're just Christians and we believe the Bible, but we just interpret it differently than you do. And then when you keep peeling back the layers of the onion, you find out they don't believe the Bible at all. Now, its I know that sounds like a platitude, but I've got over 200 videos online demonstrating this. They don't believe the Bible, all right? They believe in ideology, and they impose it onto the text. Well, how did they get to the place where they're believing in ideology, and they think, they pro- I think they really think they're believing the Bible. They really think they do, and they don't. So it's it's a twofold problem is number one, how did they get this way? How can we prevent people from becoming that way? And what can we do in love to minister to those who are afflicted by this by this illness? What can we do to minister to those who are afflicted by it and stop them stop it from being contagious from infecting other people? And the the answer to that is not obvious. And that's why I'm doing this video set to show you where it's led. People think that, um, you know, your channel took a turn. No, my, <laughs> like you used to deal with Calvinism and now you're dealing with all this psychological stuff. It's, like, it's not the way it's happening at all. Actually, I'm digging deeper into that same problem. Now, what I found when I dig into this problem is that there's an issue of ideological possession. Now, that's another way of saying beholden to a paradigm. Or people confusing the map for the terrain. A paradigm is is like a set of ideas. Okay, It's like a meme complex. It's a set of ideas that when you put all the ideas together, it forms, say, a particular worldview or a particular way of looking at things. And the Calvinist worldview, the Calvinist paradigm, is nested within the Christian paradigm. And that's the only reason for convergence on some things. But it has its own distinctives, where it, it is its own. So it is, like, like a parasite, it is reliant upon the host of the Christian meme complex in order to propagate itself within that. So Christians evangelize lost people to Christ. Calvinists evangelize Christians to Calvinism. Okay, it's, it's, like, it's like a cancer that spreads. And I'm not using those terms lightly. I'm not using those terms lightly. I mean, I really mean this stuff. Um... When you look at what Christianity should be doing, um, Calvinism 
is so disorienting away from following Jesus Christ. You got these hotheads online yelling at each other. They're all oriented toward these propositional conclusions. So in ideology, you think of the purpose of education is to pass down uh, when I'm thinking of societally, as a society and as a culture, the purpose of education is to pass down the knowledge of the previous generation down to the next generation so that they don't have to start from scratch. Okay, So the civilization can, can pick up where you left off and keep moving forward in a positive direction. Well, as we try to do this, we, often, we also pass along inadvertently vulnerabilities in the way that people work, in the way people think, and in the, in, in the way people th- and in the way people don't think. And we pass down um, memorization, focus on propositional conclusions rather than real knowledge, the other three kinds of knowing. And, and when people get focused on propositional conclusions in having mode, they become attached to them. They become identified to them. And then when you try to deal with just the facts, they feel personally attacked. They feel personally attacked and they go into defense mode. It's almost like you're a, when you say, when I suggest that perhaps something in Calvinism isn't correct, I do not get back a, a sound-minded epistemic answer for why they think it is. Maybe one time out of a hundred. But what you get back is a moral diatribe about how man-centered and prideful you are and how you would be able to see clearly if God would just open your eyes. And if you didn't love your own free will so much, you might be able to see what the Bible... That's what you get back. You get all kinds of nonsense like that. Ideologues. So something goes wrong, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. So when you have an ideologue... I have this little line here. I drew this because there's this line. When you start delving down, when you start peeling back the layers of the onion, you get layers of the onion, you get to this level past which it almost seems daunting to go. You just can't go. And that is ideological possession itself. Now, ideological possession is not unique to Calvinism. You can be ideologically possessed as a Christian, okay? Or as any flavor of Christian. Or as a King James only guy, or as a charismatic tongue speaking person, or as a dispensationalist, or as a Calvinist, or as an Eastern Orthodox, or as a Catholic. You can be ideologically possessed as an abortion rights advocate, or as a pro-life advocate, or pro-global warming, or against global warming, or uh, think of anything that happens within politics. You can be like like the woke and the CRT stuff. That is complete ideological possession. And it's funny how James Lindsay and Peter Boghossian and Helen Pluckrose have drawn, and mainly James Lindsay, have drawn connections and similarities between the the sin, the unpardonable sin, or the original sin of white privilege that cannot be absolved in critical race theory and social justice warrior movement. And they drew a connection. There's a parallel between that and Calvinism where you have this total depravity thing that cannot be absolved. And you have two two parallel ideological possession type things that are both religious in nature. And that's what ideological possession is. It's when, it's when something becomes religious in nature. Now, the reason this is confusing here, if, if you're talking about critical race theory or the social justice warrior or the woke movement, that kind of thing, it's pretty easy to differentiate because they, that movement is attempting to work in a secular environment. And when you point out that it has a religious component to it, a very strong religious core to it, it's got religious language and religious moralism to it, when you point that out and it's basically a religion, it's, it's eye-opening because of the stark contrast of the secular nesting in which it is trying to manifest itself. See? When Calvinism presents itself, it has a manifestation of itself as a religion that is distinct from the Christian religion, that is a self-induced illness like the woke movement, 
But because it's nested within Christianity, it is much more difficult to to see the line of debarkation between the two different kinds of religion. See, Christians have moralistic behavior too. And the, and the thing about Calvinism is as it is a parasite latching onto Christianity, it can actually borrow directly all of its moralistic language, which gets into one of the, one of the things you know about a, uh, an ideologue is the, the corruption of language. So there's this line here, and the things that occur to me, and this is kind of, I'm trying to paint the picture for you because we've been dealing with this, all this stuff. We haven't dealt with any of the stuff in red yet. And if we could fix all this stuff, it would be a prophylaxis against people becoming Calvinist, but really against becoming uh, ideologically possessed in any way. All right? So we don't want people to be ideologically possessed. And it kind of started off something like this in my mind, where you have the meaning crisis, and in the meaning crisis, people aren't connected. And in Christianity, we are claiming to be connected with God, with base reality. But we are not really connected with God, with base reality. We're connected with an in-group and a set of propositions that serves as a proxy between us and God, between us and base reality. We constantly get onto the Catholics because they... You know, there's one God, there's, you know, one mediator between God, man, the man, Christ Jesus, but they have the Pope and all these priests acting as mediators. We go on to them for that. Well, at least they admit it. We really have the same problem. I say we, non-Catholics. I have a Baptist background. Baptists have never been identified with Rome, but all across Protestantism and, and even in Baptist circles, we really have the same evangelicals. Okay. We have the same problem is that we have a mediator between us and God, but we're not privy to it. And that mediator is ideological possession. It's in-group belonging and propositional tyranny. The reduction of all kinds of knowledge to sets of propositions, to statements. A proposition is a statement like all cats are mammals, okay? That's a statement, okay? And that only means something to you if those phenomes coming out of my mouth are interpreted by you in a way that comes back out to what I think of when I think of a cat being a mammal, okay? And if that image doesn't more or less come out on your end, then that is a meaningless pointer, a meaningless proposition that doesn't mean anything. And the more meaningless, the less shared of real knowledge, because you, you have a real understanding of what a real cat is. I have a cat here, and I think of this furry animal that purrs and likes to be petted and fed and stuff like that, and... That is what the real thing is. And when I say cat, it's just pointing at that. But I might say gato or something else. I might be able to use a different pointer. The pointer isn't the thing. And that's where Christians go wrong. We have all these propositional statements in our statement of faith at church, and they're just pointers. But we think the pointers are the thing. You see? Our statement of faith and our in-group are the proxy between us and God, and we think that when we please the in-group, we're pleasing God, but we're not in touch with God. What does it do when you think you're in touch with something, but you're not really in touch with something? It's disorienting. I'll give you an example. <laughs> I knew somebody not long ago who couldn't play 3D video games because it made them gave them motion sickness. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But then I... <laughs> I can play 3D video games just fine, but there's certain VR games where, like, so there's some space flying ones, and then there's like a racing game where you're t it looks like you're in the car and you're turning the wheel. Everything's just like racing, except you don't feel anything that is in connection with what your eyes think, where your eyes are trying to tell you that you're immersed in. You don't feel that in the rest of your body. And that is disorienting, gives me motion sickness. I think part of the mental health crisis that's happening. Um, you know, in addition to COVID and all this other stuff is along with the meaning crisis. And John Verveke talked about that on the video that he was on with me back on September uh, 24th. Go back and watch that when you get a chance. He came on live here and talked about the meaning crisis. People are not connected with God. They're not connected with base reality. They're not connected with other, with each other. And they, because of the lack of connection, there is a lack of meaning. And when people have no meaning in their life, it's very easy to resort to an ideology which gives them certainty 
and meaning and comfort and a place and a cause and a feeling of uh, moralistic rightness. Okay? So when they have no meaning in their life, ideology, excuse me, serves as a proxy for meaning connections. And then it's always moralistic. You always watch out for moralistic behavior. Somebody just commented to me on Facebook. They're like, Kevin, you're so stupid. Calvinism is not man-centered like your theology is. Now, what does that say about Calvinism? Did she give me any epistemic reason to believe in Calvinism? No. She resorted to something immor like more a moralistic thing. I am less moral than her. She's making me out to be less moral than her because she's painting my viewpoint as man-centered rather than painting it as incorrect and showing me why. See? Which brings me to this point that I just thought of before we started doing this is that uh, ideology is the art of persuading people to optimize for irrelevant metrics. Whether or not whether or not you can convince somebody that something is man-centered or not is irrelevant to whether or not it is so or not. You see? It's irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. It doesn't matter at all. So if if people are optimizing for irrelevant metrics, they're usually moralistic ref, uh, things. Like they'll call people evil or wicked or they have an ego. And I want to say this last night. We were on with the Wadester and I was looking at some of the comments. And some of the comments... Some of the people that I would consider to be good guys were using moralistic arguments about against Calvinists, talking about how egoic, you know, such an ego and so arrogant and all this kind of stuff. And, and I get it, and I've witnessed that too. And I'm guilty of this. <laughs> but what I want to do is, as a group, I want us to refine how we approach this issue and not also make that mistake back at them, okay? I don't want to be ideologue versus ideologue. They can be the ideologues, we will be the humans, okay? So let's, I want to raise our, our level of interaction if we can. And moralistic reasons for why something is right or wrong is not a good reason for why something is right or wrong. It's right or wrong regardless of whether it's moralistic, okay? In, in a particular viewpoint, because that's subjective. There's all kinds of reasons why that can't be so. Okay, so rule-based decision-making. Um, when, when a person grows into wisdom, they have the ability to respond to novelty. In other words, something you haven't been trained or taught to deal with. And they can make wise decisions in the face of novelty when somebody has not given them rules for how to operate. Okay, An ideologue can only operate in rule-based decision-making and they can't, think, they can't think outside of that rule set. Okay, So you have to, <laughs> you have to escape that and think about and I know when when you, when I start talking this way, all, all the people who are not growing in Christ, who are rule based in the way they see Christianity, they're thinking that I'm talking about trying to have a license to sin and live like the devil. And that's so not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to, like Peter, step away. You know, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. For since I was young, I've not you know, eaten anything that is common or unclean. And, and the Lord's telling him, look, what I have cleansed, call thou not common or unclean. In, in other words, there comes a time to break the rules. There comes a time that the rules that you thought applied no longer apply. And Peter had to have somebody intervene with him and tell him when that is. But the point is, if you can grow in wisdom, <laughs> The antithesis of what you see in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, the carnal Christians in 1 Corinthians 2 and 3, if you can grow, grow in wisdom, then Paul can speak wisdom to them that are perfect. In other words, them, those that are mature and ready. And you will encounter situations in your life where there are no rules that can be dictated to you for how to just follow the formula. You're not a computer. You're supposed to be a real boy. You're supposed to develop, like, like Josh was saying in the comments last night. I'm a real boy. You want to develop. You don't want to be an ideologue. Um, feeling righteous while, be, while being ineffective. This really stands out to me because um, th this, this phrase, I heard it by Daniel Schmachenberger when he was talking about COINTELPRO and how they used postmodernism to make certain political movements in the United States 
feel more righteous while being ineffective, by being less effective or ineffective. And that's and that struck me as like that is exactly what religious ideology does for people. It causes you to feel what moralistic and righteous and holy, like you're doing the good thing, and you feel righteous and holy and moral, but you're ineffective. You're not doing anything. And I think a couple of uh, I think last Sunday's message we talked about effectiveness and and what what some metrics you might look for for whether or not you're effective. Mapping reliance, map reliance, okay? Mapping and map reliance. Mapping is when you encounter an ideologue and they just map you back to some other evil thing that they know. They map you back to Arminianism. They, see, they can't deal with you. They can't encounter novelty. I remember when I was talking to Sonny Hernandez, which you should go watch that when you get a chance. When I was talking to Sonny Hernandez... I brought up Ephesians 2.12 and he had never encountered it before. And he did not know how to respond to novelty. He had a formula that he was following and that wasn't part of it. So he wasn't having a discussion. He was not having a discussion with Kevin about how to, you know, maybe we could generate insights in each other for how to understand scripture better. He was not having that kind of discussion. He was... He had his conclusions in mind, and his goal was to prove the conclusions no matter what. That was his goal. That's what he was trying to do, which is not what I'm trying to do. And I'm not just talking about when I'm in a discussion like that. In life, I'm not trying to do that, I'm trying to do something else. And when it comes to who I'm going to fellowship with and who I'm not going to fellowship with, I don't really care what they believe. I'm looking for people who are trying to do that. If you can do that, it doesn't matter where you are positionally with certain propositions. I really don't care. If, we're, if we can do that together in good faith, that's what we're looking for. But he couldn't respond to novelty, okay? And so he, re, he was mapping me back to his idea of like an Arminian or a Pelagian. And then when something shoots out that's not part of that formula, he, you know, he burns out his gears and strips his clutch plate and, and you know, starts having a conniption fit. And that's what ide- ideologues do. And then, and then for them, they have map reliance. They, they cannot update their map with the terrain. They rely, on the, they rely on the paradigm. They have their paradigm, and everything must bow down to the paradigm. Remember, it's two separate religions like the woke movement, but it's nested within Christianity. And the, the, the parasite religion is the one that they are worshiping. That's the final authority. Everything submits to that. Every verse of scripture must be twisted to fit that ideology, every single one. And every argument, this must come out as victorious. And they're aiming, they're aiming to be victorious. They're not aiming to find truth and discover and explore and be earnest. They're not aiming to do any of that. Thought conformity and simulated thinking. I like divergent thinkers. I like people who think outside the box. I almost had a chance to debate a guy named Chris Date, and he backed out. (laughs) But I was interested in talking to him because he has divergent thinking on hell, which shows me that even though he's an ideologue because he's a Calvinist, at least he has some capacity for non-simulated thinking in that he was able to reach an alternate conclusion that wasn't dictated to him by a prevalent in-group. Okay, That was interesting to me. I want to hear more about that. And so the speakers that I like to listen to, it's not so much that I agree with what they say, but the fact that they happen to be divergent thinkers is what's interesting to me. Michael Heiser happens to be a divergent thinker. Does that mean I agree with everything he says? Of course not. But I like the divergence in thinking, and that, that is what's curious to me. That sparks my curiosity. Uh, Chuck Missler, when he was alive. Ruckman, when he was alive, divergent thinking, people who aren't afraid to get in touch with what their actual perspective is and pursue it and see what it is. That interests me. And somebody who's just towing the line on simulated thinking and they've been programmed with the formula and they just, they can spit it back out. I don't care about that. I so don't care about that. So many people ask me, you know, when are you going to debate James White? I just don't care about formula followers. I don't care about encountering a botnet virus somewhere that's been pre-programmed by somebody else. I don't care. I couldn't care less. And so it's it's so uninteresting to me. Um, but show me somebody who's got some 
some uh, non-conformed thinking, some divergent thinking, like Greg Kokel. He's a Calvinist. I would love to have a conversation with him. I haven't even tried to reach out to him. But I don't, think, I don't even think, having heard him talk, having heard his demeanor and stuff, I don't think that would be a combative discussion. I think we could have a good discussion. So that would be kind of fun. So I'm not against talking to Calvinists, but um, I want somebody who's actually thinking and not just doing simulated thinking. And, and um, James White is, is like the video game mega boss of simulated thinking. There's not an original thought in his head. It's all simulated thinking. Very good mental organizing of facts into to to twist reality into what he needs it to say to map to the ideology, but still simulated thinking. And at the end of the day, not interesting. Okay. <clears throat> and then um, they have sets of beliefs and conclusions, and they have them in having mode. I encourage you to read a couple of articles about ideologues. I, I did a video on uh, James Bogosian's book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, and uh, how to talk to a Calvinist ideologue. I can't remember what it's called. I think the thumbnail was orange, though, and there was two parts to it. I highly encourage you to go watch that and go read that book. I know some of you guys have. This is just an article, and he points out in the article three things, um, ideologic Ideology eschews argument and feeds on the corruption of language. You see that a lot with Calvinists. Ideology makes blanket claims and makes ad hominem attacks. Uh, when talk becomes cheap, and that's when you become an, an avatar of an ideology, and you just start spewing the ideology, and you have all these sayings and phrases and stuff that you are you're parroting something. Okay. Now another article um, is called Three Ways to Spot an Ideologue. Now, this guy, Daniel Bell, wrote a book called The End of Ideology. I have not read that book, but I am adding it to my reading list. A set of beliefs that seek to transform a whole way of life. Now, that's what they have. They have beliefs in having mode. So, in order to spot them, you want to look for symbols or verbal clues. And in the article, there, some of those symbols and verbal clues are uh, uh, appeals and slogans Incremental improvements in technology. I'm, I'm trying to read through the article a little bit here without showing it. But refusing to discuss one's terms because a point is obvious. Insisting on euphemisms rather than plain speech. Relying on very specialized vocabulary and being unable to express one's thoughts. And that's, you know, Calvinists, they have their very specialized vocabulary that's, that's unique to Calvinistic domain. Like grace doesn't mean what grace means to the rest of Christianity. In the rest of Christianity, grace is the alleviation of the requirement to keep the law. To them, grace is a laser pinpoint, punctiliar, specific application of a forceful action that forces somebody to do something. You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. They got their own version of the will of God. They got they invented monergism and synergism back in 1891 without you know the premature optimization there not realizing that by doing so they're actually making themselves out to be synergists because they have to they still they they try to make us synergists because we cooperate by believing the gospel but they wind up being synergists because they also have to cooperate by listening to it because their own dogma teaches them that the gospel hearing listening to the gospel is God's ordained means of bringing regeneration to somebody well, they have to do that. All they did is back it up one step. That means how stupid ideology makes you. I mean, they, they come up with a whole false dichotomy that is prematurely optimized and turns out kicking them in the face in the end anyway. Identify fallacies. And I have a slide on logical fallacies. And this is not all of them, but this one is the Ten Commandments of Logical Fallacies. You have like ad hominem attacks, straw man fallacy, uh, the hasty generalizations, begging the question, post hoc false cause, false dichotomies, uh, the argument from ignorance, burden of proof reversal, that's a really big one in Calvinism. Actually, all these are really big ones in Calvinism, but burden of proof reversal is like they do this all the time when you show a point. Can you show me that Cornelius wasn't being drawn before Acts 10-2 when he was described as devout and fearing God and praying and giving alms? That's your problem. If you want to show, if you want to prove that he was being drawn or something, um, I don't have a problem with everybody in the world being drawn because Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will, I will draw all men to me. But if they want Cornelius to, if they want some kind of 
pre-regeneration to be happening to him, that's not your burden of proof. That's theirs. It's up to them to find it in the text. They are pulling it from their ideology, not getting it from the text. And that they're, they're good at that. They're really good at, at turning these logic things. So if I could put something on your to-do list, and these are just 10. There's more as well. Non sequitur, bandwagon fallacies. There's more than this. Every Calvinist who ever wrote anything good, or everybody who ever wrote any good, you know, theological work, my prop is out of reach over there. They were all Calvinists. Well, first of all, they weren't. But second of all, that's a bandwagon fallacy. It's a logical fallacy. It wouldn't matter if it was. Uh, so you need to become familiar with those. You need to make sure you're not doing the logical fallacies. And you need to make sure you can spot the logical fallacies and become fluent in logical fallacy, in logic and logical fallacy language. Okay? That is going to help you. It's going to help you go a long way. Um, so identify those fallacies and then detect irrational exuberance. And this goes into huh, this goes into the whole moralistic thing where people feel like they are more um, moral and righteous for having these sets of beliefs. The, the, the commitment to ideology, the yearning for a cause or the satisfaction of deep moral feelings is not necessarily the reflection of interest in the shape of ideas. Ideology in this sense and in the sense that we use it here is a secular religion is what this uh, article goes on to say. That's exactly what it is. So um, Calvinism is essentially an embedding of a secular religion because of its own tenets within something that is already a religion. And it's, it's such a clever disguise. When, when it happens in the woke movement, you can spot it as out of place. But when it's embedding in something that is already a faith-based thing, a religion, if you will, I know, I know you guys are out there You're saying, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. I know, I know. It's not a religion, it's a reality. I know, I know. But just bear with me here, okay? I know all the things that you guys are saying and getting sidetracked. So what do they do? Back to our little chart over here. Everything in red is stuff we haven't covered yet. In like the problems, if we could fix these as a prophylaxis, if we could produce kids who were educated to not commit these issues, we would not have ideologues. Okay. So they have beliefs in, in having mode. I have beliefs and you see people all the time do do you affirm blah 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 who cares what you affirm do you affirm this do you affirm that it didn't matter whether i affirm anything do you think god knows what do you think about the attribute of god what if i told you that it didn't matter what if what if i didn't have to have a position on any particular attribute of god on whether it was so or not what would you say then I just I don't have I don't have to make a decision because there are certain things that I know. Let me tell you what I know. There's there's a higher level of ignorance here that you have to appreciate, you have to understand. I think you've all seen the diagram. I've showed it on this channel before, where if you take a cylinder and you dissect it, bisect it halfways, the, the cross section looks like a circle. Well, if you bisect it long ways, the cross section looks like a rectangle. Now, if you put the circle and the rectangle next to each other and you tell somebody these are the same thing, they will say you're out of your mind because they're thinking two dimensionally. Well, when you reconcile them three dimensionally, there is a higher order. There's a, like what you might call a dialectic of sorts. There is a higher order of truth that is not perceivable in the lower dimension. Okay. When it comes to God, there are certain things about God that I know are true in an ignorance sense that I also know I cannot perceive from my current perspective, which is one of the reasons I'm interested in perspectival knowing where I want parallax from the fact of the logos fl flowing through a whole bunch of other people so they can help me see better, okay? And seeing better is not, the more clearly you can see, the less you rely on descriptions of the thing that you saw. If you have never been to, say, the Grand Canyon, you have to rely on a person describing it to you. And if you've never seen it, you would hang on those words and they would be kind of authoritative to you. Well, when you have seen the thing, 
the words go out the window, they don't matter anymore because now you can generate your own words to point at the thing that you otherwise know. Okay? Before you only knew it through their words, and then when you can see, it's clear. And so when there is a heavy dependence upon words, upon pointers, upon the way things are worded in the statement of faith, what that's telling you is that you're, you're dealing with people who don't have a good vision of God. They, they have not, they don't have any participatory attunement with God. They've not seen, no man has seen God at any time. They've not seen the kingdom of God, if you will, John chapter 3, verse 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The more reliance upon words, the more reliance upon ideology that you have, what they're telling you when they're so rigid about how things are worded, what they're telling you is that they have no vision for the spiritual things. That's what they're telling you by doing that. So they have. Since they don't have any vision for spiritual things, they don't have any imaginal or otherwise or parallax vision or perspectival vision of spiritual things. They're so reliant upon these words and they have them in having mode because without those words, they have nothing. They've built their entire identity. Their entire, they're emotionally identified, emotionally attached. And they, they're identified with this set of words that comprises their ideology. And they have it in having mode the same way you have things. You have, you have your house. You have your computer and your cat and your wife. And, and that's the problem with families, too. One of the reasons divorces happen is because spouses have each other in having mode. I have a wife. I have a husband. Rather than I am being a husband. And I am interacting with my wife. And there is a reciprocal opening between us to where we are both becoming better people we're both being and we are both becoming okay so when you're being when you're focused on being you stop focusing on the words themselves and you're more focused on the process of interacting with the words of scripture and then you're going to do things there's an ecology of practices for example ephesians 4 16 edification model there's a bunch of verbs in ephesians 4 that are very interesting to look at and then the doing transforms into being, and then when you have a sacred second self that you're aiming for, the more Christ-like version of yourself as the mark that you are pressing toward, then you are becoming. I just came across something earlier, and I can't remember what it was, but it, it seems like something was all geared up toward avoiding things. I can't even remember what it was. I think it was something secular, but it was all geared up toward avoid, avoiding certain errors. And you can avoid errors all day long, but you might create new problems. The, the, the thing that you need to be focused on is not avoiding errors, but on, on the thing that you're trying to become, on the thing that you're trying to do. For example, if you, uh, if you actively avoid flat tires, you can successfully do that and run out of gas and still not go anywhere. <laughs> so you, you have to focus on what you're trying to do and what all is needed to do that thing rather than just focus on the negative things you're trying not to do. I, I see this in Christians all the time. They're measuring their Christianity by their success at stopping doing wrong things. you got to stop thinking that way. You got to stop thinking that way. You have to start thinking about the 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 more Christ-like version of yourself that can possibly exist. What does that look like? Now you need to aim for that, and then you need to start thinking about what you need to be doing to become that. Okay, that's what you need to do. And this whole idea of of stopping doing wrong things, you you got to stop thinking that way. If, if you're focused on doing the right thing, the not doing the wrong things will take care of themselves. They will go away. But you have to focus on the right thing. So we're going to turn this one green. Toxic leadership. Battered partner syndrome. <laughs> it's a battered, battered wife syndrome. Battered spouse syndrome. Um, R.C. Sproul is so moralistic in the way that he talks. I think I was just talking with Wade... Uh, last night, the Wadester about this last night, how he's so moralistic in the way that he talks. It is, uh, it's emotionally bullying. 
it's emotionally abusive. And I, and I hate to use those terms lightly. I'm not, not trying to use them lightly because I'm aware of a lot of places where this stuff gets used incorrectly against people. But you're creating a barrier around an ideology and that barrier, that, that plastic bubble wall barrier around the ideology is a whole bunch of moralistic things that equate your estimation of God to your estimation of your ideology. God is a thrice holy God and he is justice and he can, so he's sovereign and he can save and have mercy on whoever he wants and he can have justice on whoever he wants. You know, that sounds great and moralistic. And it's presented, it's framed in such a way to where if you disagree with the conclusions they are presenting, then you don't think God is holy. If you don't think Calvinism is holy, then you don't think God is holy. And they speak about Calvinism the same way they speak about God. And they try to frame it in such a way to where the two are interwoven and undistinguishable to the hearer. And where if I'm going to accept God is holy, I must also receive this Calvinism with it. They're very good at that kind of stuff. It's very toxic, very toxic stuff. And something that's... Uh, <laughs> Something that also happens within ideologies is when you have an ideology and everybody has to toe the line on the thing, and you get more of this out of uh, Jonathan Haidt's work, but you can also see it in the French Revolution or in a movie like The Children of the Corn. When you have a really strict ideology, it's just a matter of time before you start having witch hunts within the ideology. Like in Children of the Corn, the main leader is Isaac. And then b before long, he... he he becomes not strong enough of a follower of he who walks behind the rose, okay? And then they wind up putting him up on the stake, okay? So, so uh, and that's the same thing that happened in the French Revolution. The, the ideology, the revolution was so strong that eventually the, the fervor of the revolution would start to see its own leaders as the traitors. And they start turning on each other, start eating each other. That's another aspect of, of ideological possession, with regard to movements and followership. And so toxic leadership happens like that. You have a bunch of mini cults that spring up. And the Calvinism, in addition to being a cult, it, it has a bunch of mini cults, persons, man-centered mini cults within it. Okay? Because in, in order to be a Calvinist, most Calvinists that I know, uh, they're focused on something, some product of a man. All right, whether they went to John MacArthur's school or they just love R.C. Sproul and they start putting them in their profile picture or they are adherent to the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith and they something from a man, they are start to elevate men that have respect of persons. And it's like battered partner syndrome, like battered spouse syndrome where you start to believe things like the bad thing that happened is your fault and um, you feel like you... You just have to keep going back to this thing and you need to make amends with it and you need to be accepted by this end group and you got to get away from it. Now, in a non-Calvinistic way, I can speak to this firsthand with my departure from some segments of the ind independent fundamental Baptist movement, which is horrid for other reasons, <laughs> but, but similar ones when it comes to end group stuff. And then Calvinists are real bad about respect of persons. It's kind of funny that the person who just accused me of being man-centered did so under an OP that was a quote from Arthur Pink, A.W. Pink. <laughs> and so, and I always say stuff like, I'm so glad you guys have authorities to quote from like A.W. Pink since you can't quote from the Bible since you don't believe it, since it's not authoritative. I don't want you to be left out, so I'm glad you found an authority that you believe. So they have respect of persons. Um... It's it's funny to me how they're always accusing Christians of being man-centered and man-exalting, all that stuff. But they're the ones that you could not piece Calvinism together if you did not have quotes from all these Brother Melmses. You got Charles Spurgeon, R.C. Sproul, A.W. Pink, and you, you know Paul Washer. You got all these guys saying these like highly moralistic sayings. And they're just, oh, it's like, you know, we win a touchdown when we post that meme. And they don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. So they have beliefs and be belief systems. And they have those beliefs and belief systems in, oops, they have them in having mode. Okay? They have them in the belief systems. I want you to think about a type of Christianity 
Think of all the belief systems within Christianity. You have the Baptists, the Methodists, the Catholics, the Calvinists, and, uh, you know, Episcopalians, Eastern Orthodox, the Anglicans, whatever, the Pentecostals, Church of God, Church of Christ, all these belief systems that are very distinctly defined by their statements of faith. And I want you to imagine, what is, what is this... The minimalist set of common threads that runs through all of those. Right? And then imagine shedding everything else. You just shed it all. Shed all those distinctives. And think about all those denominations happening down here. All those belief systems down here. And Christianity is, is up here. It's, it's more like a... It's, it's less like a defined little box. And it's more like a, like a nebulous cloud or something like that. Imagine hovering somewhere between there. Like you're metacognitive, met above and beyond. That's what you need to repent of. You need to repent of being in those paradigms. Be above meta, metanoia, repent, metacognition. Be outside, think of, be within Christianity outside of those belief systems. Outside of those paradigms. And I want you to practice that metanoia as a, as a daily thing that you do, as a daily way of being. It's something that you do. You do it, and the more you do it, the more you become, you see, the more you become more like Christ. So think outside of the belief systems, above and beyond them. Don't be beholden to them, Okay. Meta perspectival. So the map versus the terrain, they confuse the map for the terrain. Um, a paradigm has three functions, and you need to be able to evaluate the paradigm the same way you would evaluate a pair of glasses. Now, I have, I have a crazy pair of glasses somewhere around here, but I think you get the point. I don't have to show you the glasses in order for you to get the point to know what glasses are. A um, paradigm has three purposes and that is number one is to respond to reality and that's that's the reason the paradigm exists if you look around at reality and observe what it's telling you you can develop a set of rules that reality seems to be following that can help you better predict what reality will do okay for example if you observe an apple falling from a tree you can develop rules like, hey, things fall. If they're high, they somehow they are attracted to the earth. So you develop a rule about that and you call it something like you call it gravity, something like that. And some things uh, seem to violate the rule, seem to be able to overcome that rule. Maybe if they have helium in them. So, you, so now you realize my, if I have a balloon with helium in it and it floats, I realize that my paradigm is not complete. It did not account for that. Now, I don't know. Now, of course, we know it's air pressure and helium is lighter than the surrounding air. We know that. But I'm saying at the time when you're just observing freshly, you don't know what rule that's following. So you have to generate a rule. It's like, what's different about this balloon than the rest of everything else that falls? Well, it's got something else in it. What's in it? Helium. Well, we'll make a new rule. Helium seems to make things float. And now you're going to refine that. And that, <laughs> that's a process of updating your paradigm. When you recognize that your paradigm did not account for some novelty that you encounter, oh, look, there's a bird. It's not falling. Why doesn't it fall? What, how is it interacting in a way that it doesn't fall? Now you, have to, now you have three rules. Things fall. Some things don't. And the reason they don't maybe is because of helium, maybe because wings provide lift. Okay? So now you have a rule and two exceptions to it. You have modified the paradigm. You've updated the paradigm. So when what a, a paradigm conserves the paradigm is the number two function. It conserves itself and it's designed to resolve dissonance. Now, resolving dissonance has to go back to one of these two. If you go back to number one, then you update the paradigm so that you can still respond to reality. Oh, 
there's a helium balloon. Birds fly. There's two exceptions to my rule. Now I have three things that I've written down. Or you can conserve the paradigm. Those things aren't real. That I didn't really see that. That balloon really didn't float. That bird isn't really flying. And so what that is, and this is the technical term, is delusion. Okay. Now the problem Calvinists are in, the problem any ideologue is in, is that they are not in the mode of updating the paradigm so that it can still respond to reality and respond to the evidence in Scripture. They are in conserve the paradigm mode, which means they are in delusion mode. Now, and I know that sounds insulting. I'm not trying to use it insulting. That's technically what it is. They're in delusion mode. We need to, if, if you use a paradigm, you need to use it in a sense where you're not afraid to update it. And there are some Calvinists who do update the paradigm. They respond to Scripture and they encounter novelty. And they update the paradigm and they modify it. Now, we call them former Calvinists when they do that. But there are Calvinists who do it. And that's, that's how some don't want to be an ideologue who's beholden to a paradigm that has to resort to delusion to continue doubling down on finding post hoc rationalizations for why the paradigm is true anyway. I don't care what 1 John 2, 2 says. I don't care what Hebrews 2, 9 says. I don't care that God is not the subject of any verb in Acts 13, 48. I don't care that if you take the word can out of John 6, 44, that it doesn't change the meaning at all for a Calvinist. I don't care. I'm just going to double down anyway. I'm going to act like it didn't happen. I mean, I, I had, I've, I've said this before. I had a discussion with a Calvinist pastor on John 6, 44. He, in that conversation... He had to concede my point and that his arguments were no good. What did I see him doing the very next day? Using his same arguments that he admitted were disproven on somebody else. He's resorting to delusion. He's not updating his paradigm. Why do people do that? I don't know why people do that. That's the question. Why do people do that? And that's what I'm trying to fi figure out. I'm trying to figure out why is it that the facts don't matter to people. I know people are thinking of, uh, you know, pride reasons. They're thinking of moralistic reasons. A lot of times. I haven't looked at the uh, chat. Let's see how much chatting we have here. Oh. Well, we have good ways up. Debating an ideologue is trying to debate a computer program that doesn't do what you want when it's pre-programmed to not do what you want. That is exactly right. Um, the fear of the Lord is to hate arrogance. I don't know how a man of God has been humbled by the gospel can become arrogant. Now that's the problem with um, Christianity is that there, there are there are moralistic, there are fruit of the spirit and you shall know them by their fruit. So it's in, and and there does seem to be if you had a Venn diagram of narcissism and Calvinism, there would be a huge overlap. And it's I haven't really sorted out how to address that without just resorting to moral arguments. Somebody starts having coffee every time they see this guy talk. That's right. I feel like I found gold. We talk about reconstructing our thinking. It isn't what medieval liberal arts education was. Uh, teaching students how to think, not what to think. Isn't that interesting, though? And I'm, I'm glad you feel this way, and I hope, you join, I hope you join the effort in trying to take on the responsibility to figure out why people are thinking the wrong way and what we can do to try to get people more interested in that. But every Christian I know will agree that we should teach people how to think, not what to think. And then they all go to a church that has a statement of faith that tells people what to think. Why don't we have a structure, an in-group belonging threshold that is focused on the how? It's the what. There's statements. We believe da-da-da-da-da-da-da. There's statements. We are telling people what to believe. We got we to gotta switch around. Epistemic. Now that's a word. Yeah. Epistemic. So the the Greek word for faith is pistis. And when you believe something that's true, epistemics is the science behind why we should or shouldn't believe things to be true. Um, what, 
what is an epistemically valid confidence margin that you can assign to any particular truth claim. And it's a good practice to stay under 100 for propositional truth claims, especially uh, metaphysical propositional truth claims. Wisdom to understand why the rule exists allows you to know when the rule need not apply. I agree with that. It's absolutely right. Um, and that's something I encourage people to do. When you notice, you look at moral foundations theory, like Jonathan Haidt puts out in The Righteous Mind, and you realize that there are certain things that you believe are immoral because of a divine ethic. In other words, because you think God commanded that it's immoral. Think about why he would do that. Why he would do that. And on the other end, I like to think, I like to do little thought experiments, and I'll probably get kicked out as a heretic for doing this, but I don't care. I like to do a thought of experiment as think about mankind being totally adaptive and not actually having, like say it's a deistic world and there wasn't actually any interaction from God to man. Or it wasn't direct or something like that. And all the institutions that we have and all the rules that we have that we claim came from God are actually the wisdom of previous generations that evolved over time as we adapted to the landscapes and we figured out that certain things like the institution of marriage you find out that when we do this certain activity it produces another human being well maybe we should put some controls on this <laughs> it's probably a good idea to put some controls on this and some of the institutions that we have realize the severity of the unintended consequences of some of the ways that we act and and like daniel schmachenberger says we, when you want to revolutionize a society or something like that you uh, like renovating a house, you don't want to just go blindly tearing all the walls down, not knowing which ones are load-bearing, okay? So there's a lot of wisdom in knowing when you can tear a wall down uh, because you don't want to tear down a load-bearing wall. So when you're breaking rules, there's a time. There's a time to do it. There's a time not to do it. Somebody wants me to date debate James Brown. Is, are you talking about the uh, the musician? Like, we could do a dance-off, but I think he passed away. I could beat him in a dance-off now. <laughs> um, James 1, 26-27 is interesting before saying Christianity is not a religion. So yeah, I think there's a place that says pure religion is this to visit the fathers and widowless, visit the widows and fatherless in their affliction. Um, and something else. Um, it's funny. Somebody says, your intelligence is much more evident in the library. Loving all your vids. Well, I'm glad you're liking the videos. It's kind of funny because I get I get accused of two things. I get accused of being over-intellectual and being anti-intellectual. Um, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm searching for truth. What I do, and this is probably something y'all should know, is that when I watch the stuff that I watch or read the things that I read, I'm constantly looking up vocabulary words and concepts. I have, I have in my phone uh, screenshots. I take little screenshots and I crop them down to the definition and I save them in a shared folder of all the words that I learn when I'm reading or when I hear them in a podcast to somebody that's a divergent thinker that I think is smart enough to listen to. And so I try to capture all these things, and then every once in a while, I'll go to that shared folder, either on my phone or my iPad or something like that, and I'll browse through these vocabulary words to try to make them fresh in my mind. And <laughs> I'm the kind of person to where if I'm reading something or listening to something and a concept or word comes up that I don't know, I will stop the show and I will figure out what that means, and then we will keep going. Because that's important. I want to understand what's being said. And some people are not like that. Some people are like, they hear something they don't understand, they just let it go. And then and now they're just kind of a little bit lost and they just exist in this little nebulous space. And I want to encourage everyone to try to be the kind of person who is constantly trying to expand your ability to articulate and understand. One of the reasons we put pollution into the information ecology is because our articulation skill is not up to par. It's not commensurate with the idea that we're trying to convey. The idea is up here, and our our ability to explain it is down here. Okay, 
if we want to speak the truth in love, it, it might mean bring up the articulation levels for the sake of accuracy. And then if everybody is also doing the anagage and trying to come up to, that will be better for everyone. And people say, well, why don't you just put it down at, you know, everyday person's level. And, and you know, that's a, think about the, <laughs> think about the severity of that if everyone had the understanding of a three-year-old. You wouldn't want to do that. You want to educate the three-year-old and bring them up to a certain level of understanding. And I want you to see yourself that way, is bring your own understanding up to the next level. Constantly be doing that. Somebody said Calvinism leads to spiritual abuse. Yes, it is not the only thing that leads to spiritual abuse, but yes, it is. Uh, it does bring to bring spiritual abuse. Somebody was excommunicated and shunned for coming against Calvinism in their former church. Yeah, that happens. The in-group will kick you out. Divergent thinkers are often seen as simultaneously too obsessed with intellect and intellectual because they go against the consensus. That is correct as well. Let's see. What else do we have here? I've been told that my lack of grasping the doctrines of grace indicates I'm not elect. Of course. Of course, because it sees the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That... That argument there, if if you were elect, God would open your eyes. It's wrong. First of all, it's an admission of a Gnostic process of learning. God, in other words, God opens your eyes to see things that are not epistemically viable. Okay, you can't prove them sub- substantively with sound arguments and evidence, but you have to be able to see something that the words fall short of and don't accurately point at. For the average intellect. That's Gnosticism. That's functional Gnosticism. You know, whenever you accuse, whenever you point out the similarities between Calvinism and Gnosticism, they'll say things like, I don't believe in a demiurge. We're not talking about the conclusions of, of Gnosticism, the, the specific list of things they believed. We're talking about similarities of how you think people learn, which is like divine truths. I think they're supernaturally imparted, and there's no other way to get it. That's what the Gnostics believed. And um, also, I've been told my lack of grasping the doctrines of grace indicates that I'm not elect. There was something else I was going to say about that. But, uh, yeah, there's just so many, there's so many ways that, that doesn't. It doesn't even make sense if you're a Calvinist to try to argue to persuade anybody of Calvinism. It's a, it's a performative contradiction to do that because you don't believe anybody could believe it unless it's revealed to them anyway. And you're not going to do it. Only God can do it. Only God can open their heart to receive the things that are said by the Apostle Paul. Ostracism is hi- and shaming is highly effective. Yes, it is. And rightful to be in their own folly. So think about this. Think about ideology and the effect that it has. And also think about the fact that you unwittingly, you, maybe you're not a Calvinist, but maybe you're an ideologue. Maybe you're an ideologue with your Christian. Is there a way to be a Christian that is not an ideologue version of a Christian? If If you are a pre-trib dispensational fundamentalist are you focused on conclusions as well just like the calvinist is about their and theirs and are you an ideologue as well if you identify as any kind of ist i'm a mid-axe dispensationalist i'm a covenantal theologian and people want to get away from these labels and say well i'm a jesusist or i'm a biblicist well Everyone claims to believe in Jesus. Everyone claims to believe in the Bible. So you're not distinguishing anything when you say that. And it comes down to the process of edification. And the process of edification that we must engage in. So we continually engage the words of Scripture with a lot of respect and humility for the higher ignorance, the the impossibility to perceive the d- dimensionality of God and, and not to be so <laughs> arrogant and hubristic to think that we can capture God in propositional statements, in a statement of faith that could be dogmatic at all. They would always need to be updated. 
always need to be updated. There's always a helium balloon or a bird to throw your paradigm off. And you have to realize that before you start writing things down, and that's one of the reasons I'm leaning more and more and more against writing things down the longer I spend time in the Word of God, is because it's about the process of engaging it. You engage the Word of God. You meditate in them. Give thyself to reading exhortation and doctrine. And the doctrine is a policy principle or, pr or procedure by which a Christian should operate. You know, it's not a thing. To I know we think doctrine is like a belief. No, think of the Truman Doctrine or a Bush Doctrine or the Monroe Doctrine. It's a policy of action when certain conditions are met. And that's how you need to see Christian doctrine as well. It's a policy of action. What a Christian should do. You're doing, being, and becoming. That's what your doctrine is. And so then we have the edification model of Ephesians 4.16, where we engage in dialogue in good faith using rule omega, <laughs> and you're anti-fragile and not naive, and you're not tossed about with every wind of doctrine, and uh, you're speaking the truth in love. In speaking the truth, there's love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. There is an uh, implied task to raise your capacity to articulate truth so that you can do it with fidelity and accuracy. That's the implied task. And then you do it in love in that for the sake of the transformation of the other person, you're willing to sacrifice something of yourself so that something good can come in them. And that is the edification model. We have to engage in that. We have to engage in that. And it's a it's a doing thing. We did not get through. We have gone over an hour, and I don't want to make these too long. And I still have a bunch of red ones that I want to get to. So, so maybe we'll do another one of these. I appreciate everybody watching. I appreciate uh, uh, everybody who's commenting. These are a lot of fun to read and to watch. Might do a couple more of these real quick because these are kind of fun. And then we'll and then we'll wrap this up. I think there's a fear. Calvinists have no clue what election pertains to. That applies to ideologies too. All things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. That's a great passage right there, and it goes right along with when we're talking about World War Z, how people did things that there's no rule book for. Like in that movie. North Korea pulled out everyone's teeth so the zombie stuff couldn't spread. And that there's no rule book telling you to do that. They took bicycle, you know, there's all kinds of things they did. When, when's it time to cut off somebody's arm? Um, this applies to ideologies too. I think there's a fear that Calvinists have that can be summed up as God will punish me if I don't say he controls every atom. The mis they mistake love for being a sycophant. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a constant, uh, I haven't done enough anxiety. I haven't done enough to prove through my works that I am uh, persevering in the faith as holily as I ought if I were truly regenerated. So they're constantly living in fear that they have evanescent grace and perhaps that their uh, calling an election isn't sure, under using those words in a Calvinistic way, not in a scriptural way, and that perhaps they're not among the elect, or if they are, they haven't been regenerated yet. Calvinism is not the sole enemy. You've been brought up in a world full of ideas separate us from the Most High. That is absolutely right. Um, Calvinism happens to be the point of entry where I discovered the dangers of ideology. But their ideology can be elsewhere too. A double bind. Which one's a double bind? It's probably true, but I'm, yeah. <laughs> So this here, I think, is what the double bind is. Um, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, but you can't do it because you have to. Well, I wouldn't know about it unless you told me about it, and now I'm doing it because I know I should. Yeah, that's a double bind. Divergent thinkers are often... Okay, we saw that one earlier, so that's good. There's a very good approach similar to dispute medically between Pasteur and Bichamp. Not sure what that's about funny it's a french globe yeah somebody somebody looking in the background um someone's always got comments about the background some people are getting sick because the water that i had back out there and the water background by the way that i used to have I actually filmed that myself out in the gulf so i was proud of that and i liked it and it had a little bit of movement to it yeah, i liked it <laughs> cannot find a church here in edmonton alberta canada either 
Yep, finding churches is hard. There is a dearth. Calling yourself a biblicist is a subset of people that call themselves a biblical student evolved into the JWs. Right, when you call yourself a biblicist, I get it, and I used to do that kind of stuff. It's kind of sophistry a little bit. Um, everybody wants to claim that they're following the Bible, but it really it's begging the question. And what it really boils down to is despite the authority that you claim you're following, what it really what really is the issue is how you interpret that authority. And the authority essentially is evidence, and you're interpreting evidence. Scripture is the evidence, like a, a paleontologist is digging in the ground looking for bones and stuff. We are digging in Scripture, interacting with the words of God for a particular reason, and that's the evidence that we're dealing with. And it's how do you interact with that evidence? How do you interpret it? How do you use it to edify, grow, and transform? It's the how. The how is where the difference is. So what do you do with it? Um, S. User says he's learning so much. He really appreciates it. I appreciate you too. What, in your opinion, on eschatologists theorizing about Emmanuel Macron? Um, I'm not even sure. Is that, is that the French president? I don't even know what's going on about that. Is he supposed to be the Antichrist or something like that? If we do enough distributed cognition to Kevin's brain, do you think that you can get the globe star spinning? <laughs> you know, there are experiments where... Um, they have like random dot and line generators and they have people sitting in the other room concentrating very hard to try to get them to take a particular trend and they have been able to cause a modification of random dots being generated enough to be measured by a full standard deviation. So that's There's something to that. There was a background with a globe spinning that I did not use. But if you like different backgrounds, we could could do different backgrounds now. I'm in the Bible Belt. Seven years ago, I found a wonderful church, and it was uh, hit with reformers. Yeah, hit with reformers. I guess it's probably a hostile takeover. Pastor said disease was caused by germ theory. B. Champ said it was by terrain. It's both. Interesting. These are great comments. I I uh, enjoy seeing some of these comments, and I appreciate everybody who joined us for this live stream. And it's been a lot of fun. I guess we're going to have to do a part four now. There's still a lot. There's still a lot of red back here that we have to get 